This is our Sunday morning message for Park Street Christian Church for the 18th of December, 2022. We have been taking a closer look at a short passage from the Old Testament found in Isaiah 9, verse 6. So if you would open your Bibles to Isaiah 9, 6. And I'll pray as we get started today. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look at your word. Would you speak to us uh, as only you can? We want to hear from you. Um, help us to have listening ears, open hearts, open eyes. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Reads, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The prophet Isaiah wrote those words about 700 years before Jesus was born in the Bethlehem manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. We've looked at Jesus the past few weeks as a wonderful counselor, last week on the 11th of December, we took a look at Jesus as mighty God. Uh, we need him to rescue us. And today we take a look at Jesus um, as everlasting father, one to provide for us. But what a confusing title for the Son of God. It seems strange and unique that Isaiah would say this baby's going to grow up and be called the eternal father. But Charles Spurgeon put it well when he said this, How complex is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ? Almost in the same breath as the prophet calling him a child and a counselor and a son is everlasting father. But there's no contradiction. It's to us scarcely a paradox. But it is, a, it is mighty, a mighty marvel that he who was an infant should at the same time be infinite. He who was a man of sorrow should also be God over all, blessed forever. He who is the divine trinity, always called the Son, should somehow nevertheless be correctly called the everlasting Father. End of quotes. See, Jesus Christ was the physical embodiment of God. I think that there are sometimes some misunderstandings or misconceptions about Jesus, but according to the Bible, he wasn't a vice president, associate minister, a junior partner, or a member of the junior varsity, or on the B team. Philippians 2 says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Colossians 2 verse 9 says that in Christ all the fullness of God had lived in bodily, in bodily form. Throughout the Gospel of John, time and time again, he drives home the reality of the deity of Jesus the Christ when he was here on earth. You see, everlasting Father means an enduring, compassionate provider and protector. An enduring, compassionate provider and protector. What a great definition of who Jesus is. Jesus claimed to be God. He said, if you see me, you've seen the Father, John 14. He said, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am, John 10. This child of promise would become eternal father. How have you related to your earthly father can shape your view of how you relate to your heavenly father. Now that can be good or it might not be so good. It can serve to be helpful in your understanding of God, and yet it could be harmful depending upon the home from which you came. You see, the problem is that a child is not likely to find a father in God unless they see some of God in their father. Not that any earthly father <clears throat> was going to be perfect. It's impossible. But... The title of this message is, All I Want for Christmas is a Series, and today is Someone to Provide for Me. What pops into your mind when you think of fatherly responsibilities? Well, we let's spend some time seeing how it is that Jesus provides for us. We'll look at how he is the infinite provider <clears throat> as our e e everlasting father. Notice first that Jesus provides resources. 
a good earthly father does his best to provide for his children. He provides not only for their needs, but occasionally their wants as well. When a father provides something, whether it's time or companionship or a favorite snack or treat, it's amazing the way it leaves a mark on that person, on that child. As a father, you feel you love to feel that you've provided the right resources for your kids, even when it goes beyond what are to be expected as the essentials. Well, Jesus talked about that somewhat in Matthew 7, verses 9 to 11. Matthew 7, 9 to 11. He said, which of you, if he asks his son for bread, will give him a stone? Which of you, if asked by a son for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven good give good gifts to those who ask him? But notice something, your everlasting father specializes in meeting needs, but if it fits within his general permissive will for him to grant you some of your wants as well, he's liable to do that. He will provide not just things that we have to have, like food, clothing, and shelter, but he'll also provide things like encouragement, wise counsel, teaching, love, and acceptance. He provides resources. But Jesus, several times, took his disciples away from the crowds in order to teach them and pour himself into them. It was kind of like a spiritual retreat for them. And notice that in doing so, Jesus provided resources for his disciples. Back during Jesus' public ministry, he would uh, sometimes teach the people for hours upon hours. And they'd be there, they'd be hungry. On occasion, Mark 8, he says, you know, you can't send these people away. They haven't had anything to eat. Some of them have a long trip ahead of them. They might collapse on the trip back. And that was one of two occasions when he fed, uh, that was when he fed the 4,000 men, besides anybody else who was there. Another time, he provided resources and fed over 5,000 men alone, not counting others who could have been there. Providing for people wasn't just in his private ministry, however. He wants to provide for you as well. If you seek him first, he'll provide the necessities. He may also increase your income or simply choose to stretch your paycheck. Your everlasting father may send a Christian neighbor with some food when your pantry is bare. He may keep your car out of the shop by having it function properly longer than should be normally expected. He might find some way to lower your expenses. He might find someone who anonymously sends you $100 to keep your electricity on during the holidays. The Bible says in James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. This is what Jesus will do for you if you trust him. He promises he'll provide for you. And we like that kind of idea of provision. Your everlasting Father is the best provider. He'll take care of your needs. You may recall the account in the Old Testament where Abraham was tested by God and told to go and sacrifice his one and only son, the son of promise, Isaac. This is a time when a phrase was given to describe God called Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. And you know of how Abraham was about to take his son's life as an act of obedience, as commanded. God intervened and stopped him. And in the next verse of Genesis 22, verse 13, it says, Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its thorns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And maybe Jesus is providing for you as a disciple of his right now. Maybe he's providing you resources that you need as you follow him. If you stop and take stock, inventory of what you have and how he's blessed you. But Jesus also provides protection. A good earthly father does his best to protect his children. 
Back in the old in the New Testament, when Jairus came to Jesus and said, My daughter is sick, Jesus went to heal her. But on the way, they were told that she had died. But Jesus gave her uh, complete healing for the moment and brought her back to life from the dead. Mark chapter 9, there was a man who came to Jesus and told him that his son was possessed by a demon. And Jesus simply said, the man simply said, please help me. And Jesus, the everlasting father, helped him. Almost always at Christmas, we think of a time when a number of months after Jesus was born, perhaps 18 to 24 months after he was born, um, the Heavenly Father, in order to protect Jesus, warned Joseph in the dream of King Herod's plot. He acted interested in the wise men's discovery of the Christmas star, and so the birth of this special child was something that was of interest to him because of his pride. In an effort to kill the child, we believe again he was 18 to 24 months old at this point, Herod sent the wise men to find the child under the pretense of wanting to worship him. Uh, the wise men brought gifts to this child, but the Lord warned them in a dream not to return to Herod, and so the Lord also sent an angel to appear to Joseph in a dream and to take the baby later out of Egypt for Herod, who was trying to find and kill him. Uh, there was protection from from the father throughout the whole story. And sometime later in Matthew 2, 19 and 20, it says, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared to him to a, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go back to the land of Israel for those who are trying to take the child's life or dead. Now, it may not seem as dramatic for you or me, but we have provision and protection from the father continually. But Jesus also provides protection for you. He wants to protect you, namely, from the evil one. He wants to protect you from the fiery darts that Satan might send your way. That's why Jesus says to his disciples, pray that you will not fall into temptation. We're to be on our guard. We are to take advantage of the protection Jesus offers us from spiritual stagnation. He wants to protect you from harm just as any father would. Years ago, the preacher Estelle, Estelle Taylor related the story of when he was a child and he told his parents who were, by today's standards, below the poverty line, that he wanted one gift for Christmas, and that was a pair of roller skates. That's what he wanted for Christmas. And somehow, lo and behold, that's what he got for Christmas, was a pair of roller skates. And back there, it was also the time when a lot of homes had linoleum floors, but they also, majority, had wood-burning stoves. And Estelle Taylor was trying to learn how to use his new roller skates, and he was warned, as any good father would do, to be careful and to not be roller skating around in the living room where the wood stove was. But... Uh, like most kids, learning to roller skate. Uh, he had a hard time turning, and it was a very difficult time learning how to stop. And he went scooting across the kitchen floor and got into the living room and lost control and was headed right towards the wood stove, which was um, very hot at the moment. And he was in trouble. But his father reached out at the last possible second and held his hand up in front of his son's head and pushed the son back, preventing him from making contact with the red hot wood stove. But in the process, the momentum, the force of the son skating pushed his dad's hand into the back of his hand into the wood stove and the smell of burnt flesh quickly filled the room. And he had a severe burn. Um, instead of the boy's body, his face being scarred for life, the father's hand literally was scarred for life, the back of his hand. Estelle Taylor said that all his friends thought that hand was hideous. 
but to him it was a hand of love and protection. And years later, when his father passed away, the undertaker had taken the father's unblemished good hand and placed it over the scarred hand in an effort to hide that, that scar, that deformity to the back of the man's hand while he lay in the casket. And Esther Taylor said, no, you need to reverse it and put the scarred hand on top of the good hand because the last thing I want to see is that hand that spared me from the fire that scared me from being that spared me from being burned someday if you're walking with Christ you will see the hand that spared you from eternal death and you'll see it was a scarred hand as well it was nail scarred Jesus wants to provide for you resources and protection but he also wants to provide for you discipline you see, any good father disciplines his children. It's an expression of love. It's a necessity of learning and a motivation for maturity. When I was growing up, um, my father disciplined me. He taught me right from wrong. He taught me how to behave. Though, I have to admit, I didn't always follow his instructions. I did the majority of the time, learn from his instructions, his discipline. Jesus disciplines us in a variety of ways, both long distance and up close and personal. He disciplines us through the Holy Spirit, through Christian friendships, accountability partners, through biblical teaching, through his word, when we read it and pray over it privately. Sometimes we miss out and think that discipline is strictly punishment, but discipline is deepening and maturing if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're his disciple. It helps you to grow up into his image, his likeness. Hebrews 12, verses 7 and 9 says, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons, for that what son is not disciplined by his father. If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, the Hebrew writer says, then you're illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we all had human fathers who disciplined us and we, we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? See, the everlasting father disciplines his disciples. He taught them, he rebuked them, he trained them, he trusted them. He allowed them to take some risk and he sent them out two by two. When they were scared and in the midst of a storm in a boat, he cried out to them, O ye of little faith. And he will discipline you too, especially if you're serious about growing and maturing into the likeness of Jesus. A coach will sometimes begin the preseason by taking the players and trying to determine their commitment level. Are they willing to pay the price of going through the upcoming training and discipline? Do you really mean business? Are you willing to put in the extra effort to give the extra time? Jesus provides discipline. But he also, lastly, that I want to note today, wants to provide security. A good earthly father will always try to provide security for his children. He works to make sure there's enough to eat, um, and he does his best to live a life of integrity before the, the watching eyes and ears of listening ears of his children. He provides security through love and, and there's complete security in that home because there's a father there. And that's why there's a sense of security. And it's a tragic thing that we're facing the consequences from every day in our culture of too many fatherless homes. I remember back on December 13th, 2003, when U.S. troops found and captured Saddam Hussein. Here was a man who for years had the security of material possessions. He had dozens of palaces. And yet after a few months of hiding, he was found in a six to eight foot deep hole concealed by a concrete lid for fear of capture and death. He was discovered about nine miles outside his hometown of Tikrit. 
Here was a man once obsessed with hygiene. And when he was captured, he was unkept with a bushy beard and matted hair. What a contrast. For many, many of us, it's just the opposite. We may have started out with very little, but in the end, we get to to share eternity with our Heavenly Father. We'll end up with the riches of the King because of what the Everlasting Father provides for us. Sometimes I think we forget that. This time of year from through Thanksgiving into December and into New Year's, the suicide rate can dramatically increase. People don't know or they forget the truth that there's a Father in Heaven who wants to provide for them. Instead, they're tempted to listen to Satan's whispers. If you truly care about others and you care about those who are in your life and how you might impact them for the future for Jesus Christ, then no matter how difficult things get, please don't take your own life. In heaven, there's a Father who wants to provide for you. And not that suicide is the unforgivable sin. That's not my call. It's not my judgment. It's not my understanding of the teacher of Scripture necessarily. But when someone commits suicide, when believers do, Satan wins a little bit of a victory and the influence of that person that they had for good through their lifetime is greatly diminished by that sudden, oftentimes impulsive act. Reach out for, for help to a friend. And if you're going through some really difficult times this Christmas season, um, I would love to hear from you to do anything I can to pray for you and encourage you. And you can call me at area code 660 342 3068 at any time. And I'd be glad to listen. Just don't forget, God is for you. And He can help you overcome. Your everlasting Father promises to provide for you in all the areas of your life, but you have to take Him at His word and trust Him. He promises to never leave you nor forsake you. Think of it as a little child would. If the father takes their responsibility seriously, they do their best to pour into the life of that son or daughter. As a result, the child doesn't worry about what they're going to have for dinner tomorrow. They don't worry about the two-hour drive to the grandparents' house for the holidays, if they're going to be safe. Their father is going to do the best he can to make sure they're safe. Or if they go to spend the night at a relative's house, the father does his best to make sure it's a secure in, uh, atmosphere and environment. They don't have to worry about that. They feel secure because of their father. They just trust their dad has things under control and is doing his best undergirding it all with an incredible sense of security. I remember when my mother was killed by a drunk driver some 49 and a half years ago. Other verses of scripture I heard initially. One passage I heard actually in the emergency room waiting area after we knew that she was gone with the Lord and we were left motherless. Psalm 121 was read where it says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is at your, the, your shade of your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He'll watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where's my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Do not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber or sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord will keep you from all harm. 
He's going to watch over your life. You're coming and going both now and forevermore. There comes a point in time in everyone's life as a believer in Jesus that you'll need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have an everlasting Father who will provide eternal protection and peace and compassion and care. You need to know that He is the one who neither slumbers nor sleeps. Nothing you face caught Him off guard. Nothing you have to encounter, even that because of your own disobedience or because of the fallout of somebody else's sinful choices. Sometimes good people get caught in the fallout of ungodly people's choices or even normally good people's bad choices. God will bring you through it. He does not promise as your everlasting Father to spare you from every hurtful experience here on earth because He uses them in your life in a very positive way. And He will see you through those stronger and better. But He's called the everlasting Father. He's the one who will provide for you. So, this week before Christmas, you can realize that Jesus was born in a manger but he was destined for a cross and that our everlasting father provided everything that we needed essentially when he was on the cross at Calvary. Let's pray. Thank you, our heavenly father, almighty God for sending Jesus to be our wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father perfect for our needs. I pray that you'll touch anyone who's listening who has that void in their life, that they would reach out for help and hope. Thank you for your promise to always be with us, to never leave us nor forsake us as your children. We need you breath by breath, moment by moment, day and night. And we're grateful that you're there. And you provide everything we need. Help us to lean on you. I pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. And amen.